Hi, this is Lawrence Juber of Wings, and you're listening to Things We Said Today with Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci. Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about what's going on news-wise in the world of the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, and I'm one of the co-hosts of this show, and some of you just might know me for another Beatles program that I host called Every Little Thing, which is syndicated around the world, and uh, I'm being joined by my co-host, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner, George Harrison Examiner, Paul McCartney Examiner, Monkeys Examiner. Oh, man. Examiner, Examiner. You know, his writings are all over the place. And his name is Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And we are all over the world today, um, as, yes, as, yeah. uh, as you will explain. Well, we're doing this by Skype, which is something that we're going to hope to do a little bit more frequently. Um, and we're being joined on the show by an author of a new Paul McCartney book, and his name is Luca Parassi. He lives in Italy, so he's talking to us. You're on the west coast of the United States. I'm on the east coast. He's all the way in Italy, and we're all recording this show together. He's written a, a new book. It's called Paul McCartney Recording Sessions, 1969 through 2013, and uh, subtitled A Journey Through Paul McCartney's Songs After the Beatles. So we welcome Luca to our show. Hi, everybody. Hi, Ken. Uh, hi, Stephen. Thank you very much for this invitation. I'm very glad to be with you, really. Let's just start the conversation by talking about how you came up with the idea of doing this book. I mean, for one thing, it's different from other Paul McCartney books because, first of all, it only covers his solo career, and it covers all of his music from the very beginning up through the new album. So it's it's as complete up to this point as can be. Yeah, it, it started off a long time ago because I'm obviously a big fan of uh, of Paul and I remember that uh, to tell you the truth back in 1999 I started thinking of a book um, on the, every Paul McCartney solo song because at the time uh, there was no book like this. So I started thinking of uh, sort of an encyclopedia of these songs from A to Z or something like that. Then during the years I changed a little bit my my idea and I came up with this uh, book that is uh, that shows the, the songs he recorded during his solo career in the order they were recorded, at least according to our sources. And it was mm. not an easy task, but uh, a lot of fun. And I think uh, also these days, this is uh, maybe the only book that uh, is written about uh, about McCartney's uh, solo compositions uh, uh, in, in this way. So I'm quite proud to tell you the truth. As you should be. Steve? Um, and Luca, so you first issued this book in Italian... Yes. And and then you um, issued the English uh, uh, edition with updates. Is that correct? Yeah, it is correct. Uh, the first edition of the book, uh, you remember, I, uh, I sent you a note was uh, was issued in, in February 2012. Then uh, in February 2013, there was a second edition that featured uh, the Tony Clark's introduction. And then in uh, November uh, 2013, there was this uh, this uh, English uh, edition. So yes, it was a huge uh, success also in Italian because uh, we we have we have uh, we had a couple of books on uh, on Paul McCartney's career, but nothing more. And so I wanted to focus on only on his music and not talking about anything else. So it was uh, it was well acclaimed uh, also also in, in Italian. Well, that's one aspect of the book that I find refreshing, that it focuses on the music only. 
Let's talk about the format of this book, because one thing that I think some fans might be surprised to learn is that you concentrate solely on the songs that Paul wrote or co-wrote. So any of the songs that he covered, like the 50s rock and roll on the Russian album, or Run Devil Run, or something like Love is Strange, or um, Denny Lane songs from Wings, those songs are not covered in the book. It's strictly the ones that he wrote. Why did you ch uh, choose to go that route? instead of covering every song that he released yeah it, it, it is uh, it is uh, it is a choice and i explain it uh, in the introduction obviously i would have liked to include everything he did believe me but uh, in the end uh, i focus on his compositions uh, that are the, the compositions included in the book are 383 uh, because uh, Paul Paul is a, is a composer, is a fantastic composer. We all know this. He's the most important composer of popular music. And uh, so the, the the aim of the book was to show, uh, let me say, a genius at work. So how he composes the songs, how he records this song, how he came up with uh, with uh, ideas for the arrangement uh, so uh, mm. i thought that maybe uh, a book of over 400 pages uh, on his songs was better than, than have uh, uh, i don't know how many pages uh, uh, including uh, really everything but maybe this could be an idea for a volume 2 who knows that's exactly that's what my next question was going to be have you consider doing a volume two on the other songs yes i'm i'm definitely considering uh, but this this book is uh, is really what, what i consider most important because of of, of the fact I, I, I said before so i think the most interesting thing is uh seeing uh, looking at uh, paul's compositions then i understand that uh, there's a word uh, outside uh, he did uh, two rock and roll covers albums he did the kisses on the bottom one he did a lot of things outside his mm. composition so i think it could be interesting but uh, uh, maybe to split uh, in two volumes could be an idea because uh, you can focus uh, better on, on on your on your subject uh, and then the, the risk, uh, the other way, could be to write uh, so much but uh, not going in depth. And so it was something I, I wanted to avoid. So if I will have uh, uh, new material, new information, new things to, to, to say and to write, I will definitely do it. Hmm. Um, I have, it's, it's really a two-part question here. The sources for your information, number one, you did a lot of interviews yourself for this book, and then you also had so many other sources from uh, Beatle fanzines, like Beatle Fan, or going into Paul's own news, uh, news fanzine that he used to put out called Club Sandwich. There's certain books that you used as a reference, and like I said, there's also the interviews that you've done yourself. What have been the most useful talking about not your interviews, everything else, all the other references that you've used in, in coming up with the information for this book. And then the other part is the interviews that you've done, who have been the most fascinating people, who lent themselves the most to coming up with really interesting information about the songs that Paul wrote. Oh, uh, that, that is a, uh, uh, quite a tough question. Well, the most useful source, uh, it, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell because, uh, uh, well, the book has got really nearly uh, 900 footnotes. And mm. that's, uh, that's something I'm quite proud of because, you know, if you, uh, well, uh, have so much so many sources uh, you have to quote everything so if you want to do something historical you have to quote the sources 
So I'm not sure. Yeah, obviously you 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 mentioned Beatle fan. Beatle fan is right. is a fantastic fanzine, as, and really it was a source of uh, really important and fascinating information because they are not the the usual questions. So when they they are interviewing uh, someone, uh, they they know what what they're talking about. So that's another fanzine that I would like to mention. It's called Magazine. This is a Dutch fanzine that is really, really incredible. It's a source of information that uh, I think uh, uh, it, any any Paul McCartney fan could not miss. There's two fanzines I, I, I mentioned. Obviously, all the other sources, interviews done by Paul, everything was useful. Everything. Really, so I would like to say that uh, when you want to build uh, this kind of book, you, you you have to consider as many sources as possible, and, and then uh, and then obviously the the ability is also to to take in the most important uh, things, and, uh, and and I think there was so much material to 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 build a book like this, so. I think it's uh, uh, it, it, it's a good thing that uh, uh, the internet the internet has been really helpful because you can Google any time and a, a, a number of results come up and you have to, to choose and you have to understand. So that's uh, that's to to answer uh, at your first part of the question. And then uh, about the interviews I did, uh, well, the most fascinating. Uh, well, it's hard, but maybe I would I would say I had an interview with uh, Dr. Richard Niles, the producer, that uh, um, uh, worked with Paul in 1986 um, when Paul was uh, working on on his famous cold cuts project that, that, that is still unreleased. And uh, Richard Nice uh, really told me a couple of uh, interesting things. There's a, an anecdote that maybe is worth telling, that, uh, that Paul was, was playing the piano in his, in his studio and, and Richard was, uh, was listening to Paul and Paul said, uh, well, Richard, uh, can you help me finish this song? <laughs> And it was quite surprised because you know, if Paul McCartney asks you for 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 help uh, on a song, it, it, it's quite unusual. But uh, uh, in the end, Paul said, "Okay, I got these two parts, and I cannot link the two parts because they are in two different keys." So Richard said, "Well, Paul, it's not a problem. Uh, just add." Uh, a couple of bars between the first part and the second, and everything would be okay. So Paul tried and uh, and he succeeded. He said, "Well, you, you are right, Richard. Uh, how, how is it possible?" Richard said that uh, it's it's a question. It's a simple question. It's a simple thing because the ear relaxes and you cannot feel uh, or hear. A key change. So this kind of uh, things, this kind of anecdotes, are, are really what I was searching for. So this is, a, is an example, maybe also for the listeners to to understand what's in the book. And there there are seventy interviews that I that I did. So there's so much uh, material, new material, new information in the book. Hmm. And what song was that for? Oh, the song is not released, uh, and it's called uh, "Your School." Uh, oh yeah, I know, I know that one. Yeah, it's a ballad. It's a piano ballad. It's a it's a great song, in my opinion. And uh, unfortunately, it's not uh, has not been released. But uh, this is the title of the song, and, and Richard uh, and Richard told me. You know, Richard, remember, <laughs> it was <laughs> it was funny because uh, Paul also said that uh, he was trying the song over and over and and uh, and Linda and Linda said uh, if you if you don't finish this song now 
you, you won't you won't have dinner this night, Paul. So please uh, do something. <laughs> Luca, how many, how exactly, how many years did it take to to do all the interviews um, for this? No, the interviews have been conducted over a, more or less a two-year period. Okay. Because I know yeah, seventy are are in the book. Uh, someone said no thanks, all these things, but uh, the majority were uh, were interested and. Um, they were proud uh, to be interviewed for for a, a, a book like this. I noticed you didn't interview any of the current band members. Um, did you ask them to uh, to be interviewed? Yeah, I I asked uh, both. I think uh, I tried with with Brian uh, Ray and also with Rusty, but uh, they did not reply. So I I can understand that. Uh, if you are playing maybe now with him, it's not maybe it's not the same. If if uh, maybe thirty years of, has passed, or uh, maybe it's different. But uh, mm, there were there were some interesting interviews uh, uh, over the net, and so there there is uh, there is something from uh, from Brian for sure that I picked up somewhere. So yeah, I, it would have been uh, definitely a great thing to have uh, to have someone um, of the current band, but uh, you know, it was it was not possible, unfortunately. Okay, Luca. One of the most fascinating things that I found about this book, and I shouldn't be all that surprised about this. I'm so used to knowing the chronology of how all the records were released. And thinking to myself that in most cases, the songs as they were released were relatively new. Or there were songs that were worked on within the year of its release. But as you start from the very beginning, you realize there are so many songs that were just, that had been around or were started so many years before they ever were released. And there are some that I already knew about. But in many cases, there were quite a number of them that I, I wasn't aware how much older the songs were. Now, it's not, it's not that big a deal if you're talking about three years in some cases, but if you're used to thinking a song like Country Dreamer, which came out in 1973, very early on, you're saying there was a demo in 1970. Um, yeah. I Lie Around, 1970. I know it's, it's only three years, but in my mind, I'm so used to thinking of the songs, associating them with the years that they were released, or at least within a year. Because in so many cases, McCartney worked on an album a certain year, it came out the next year. Yeah. And we all know, in, in the case of Red Rose Speedway, that he, was, that he had a double album ready of material. And certainly when you learn about Ram, my God, <laughs> he had so much material coming out at that time that he was recording that could have easily have been a double album. But even learning uh, My Love, I was shocked. <laughs> uh, you say here, it was written in the early days of his relationship with Linda. This is what Paul said, 1969 yeah. to 1970. I, I, I couldn't believe that when I, when I heard that. So one of, the, one of the great aspects of reading your book is realizing how a lot of these songs Maybe they weren't fully developed, but certainly they were started many years before they were released. And that's one thing that I walk away with with this book, is that a lot of songs were sitting on the shelf, or at least they were still either in its early stages or developing. It took many more years to finalize. And I would have thought that the majority of Paul's songs were far more immediate. Yeah, you are you are raising a... a a really important point uh, because uh, and that's why I, I built the book uh, as a recording session um, well if you, if you go through the stories behind each songs you can really understand uh, which is the process uh, because Paul is a non-stop composer so mm -hmm. if you compose at this rate with, with, with non-stopping it is really hard uh, to record immediately and to 
issue uh, as soon as possible. He obviously he, he tools, he, he, he do a lot of things. So uh, all all these discoveries that, that that you mentioned, well, I, I was the first to be shocked <laughs> when I learned yeah. that my was was composed maybe three, two or three years before its uh, uh, its uh, its release. But then I learned that uh, this is the way he works, uh, and. Uh, well, he, he could uh, he could uh, well write a song and record immediately, like maybe in the case of Wildlife. But uh, well, the majority of the songs uh, have been written really at least a couple of years before the release. And mm. uh, well, if we if we think that uh, he released nearly four hundred songs and. Uh, I I know that we have uh, at least the same number of unreleased songs or ideas. We know that uh, he composed after the Beatles more or less uh, 1,000 songs or something. So you can imagine that he's always writing, he's always uh, doing things. So uh, this is an aspect that makes me smile when... Uh, during the interviews, uh, uh, th- there was a, a recent one with Rolling Stone that says, uh, are you recording, are you writing some music? And he says, well, yes. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's uh, what he's doing, w- what he does. So he's always writing, he's always recording, he's always uh, having ideas. So maybe to follow, to follow his compositions, in a, in a different way than uh, than following the releases, maybe has uh, could uh, could be could be the best the best way to to understand uh, uh, his way of, of working. Mm. It's funny you mentioned wildlife because one of the songs that I wanted to bring up to you was "Some People Never Know," and in your book. You do say that he was writing that in 1969. Yeah. It says the first version of the song was recorded at home by Paul with the help of an unknown male singer. It is said to be moving and still in the vaults. Uh, Written in the summer of 69 in Barbados on vacation with Linda. So there's a lot of songs here. I mean, we're aware of the fact that there were a number of songs that the Beatles, that, that each of the Beatles released uh, in their solo careers that they wrote or started writing while they were still in the Beatles. Some people never know <laughs> was a song Paul was writing when he was still a Beatle. Yeah, right. And th- that's, a, that's another, another interesting thing because uh, I do think that, uh, well, the best results in McCartney's career come from the first two years. So personally, uh, I think that the McCartney album and the Ram are really the best, uh, mainly because uh, because uh, they contain Beatles material. Well, Danny had uh, a fantastic career with Wings, a uh, solo career that are full of great songs. But during '70 and '71, he, he was he was basically Asian Beatles songs, huh? you understand me? So, so it's, it's right what, what you said. Uh, well, also, Maybe Amaze was, was written in late, uh, late 68 or early 69. So, Every Night mm-hmm. was another song that was re- rehearsed during the Get Back session. So, we all know about Teddy Boy, uh, Junk, right. uh, The Back Seat of My Car, all these things are great another day and yeah 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 all, all this all these things uh were were, were shaping uh, during the beatles days so so i i'm personally convinced that the first two albums of paul are, are, are really my favorites I'm, I'm not saying that are the best sorry but are really my favorite and then uh each one could uh, could have a different uh, uh opinion than myself and i like also his 
all his 70s. I think that during the 70s, really, he experimented a lot. He, he, he was doing pop music, but uh, not only, you know, big successes or big hits. Uh, all these, uh, all these albums uh, had uh, colors, uh, had uh, a certain feeling, very different uh, one to to the other. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a particular, I'm a fan particularly of, of his seventies. Okay, we could have a whole new discussion <laughs> talking about <laughs> yeah. what you think Paul's best music is, and um, you know, I love all the decades and. Each decade and each period has its own merits to it, you know. And yeah. the thing about about Paul in the '70s in particular that I think a lot of people don't take the time to realize is that Paul produced his music in the '70s. He was, in many cases, the sole producer, and it had yeah. a certain sound to it. Whereas once he moved into Tug of War with George Martin, he was always working with different producers, and they all put their own stamp on Paul's music, even though Paul was very much involved with production. So I think a lot of people look back to the 70s as being more of a pure sound from Paul. They like the band feel of Wings. You know, mm -hmm. uh, some people prefer it for that reason. What you think of the material in which is the strongest is a whole other issue. But, um, yeah, I, you know, I like hearing different points of view. But Steve? Well, to to point up what he was saying about what you were saying, Ken, about uh, the uh, long time between the beginning of the song and the ending of the song, or the release and record uh, of the song, I just happened to find two. When one of them is same time next year, which was started in '78 and not released until 1990, and then my Carna my Carnival, which was started in '75 and not released till '85. So there's just two examples of that. Right there. But my, I was going to ask, uh, Luca, uh, one of the stories in the book that um, I found interesting was the one about here today and um, the fact that they uh, there was actually some crying going on that kind of led to that, led to the uh, the writing of that song and the mention of the the, the tears in the song. Um, I found that really interesting. you remember how that information came out, came about? Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, let me say that uh, that uh, I, I personally consider here today one of the most uh, moving songs that he ever composed. It was. Uh, it's not easy. It's not easy to compose a song for a friend who has passed away mm -hmm. without, uh, you know, without uh, sounding. Uh, well, I don't know the word, but uh, you could be. Maybe you could have a song that uh, it's not uh, maybe understood by 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 people. It's not uh, it's not easy. And uh, Paul Paul uh, during an interview, I think it was uh, I got a book here so I can take a look. Uh, uh, I think that Paul uh, has got this interview in 2001. I think. Mm -hmm. And he talked about uh, uh, um, something that really happened between him and John. And, uh, and um, I would like to thank Paul for, for this explanation because uh, without, uh, without this explanation, it could be a little bit hard to understand really, even if the message of the song is, is clear to everybody. Mm -hmm. He said that uh, uh, he and John were... were uh, were together because they were on tour, and um, but there was a, there was a hurricane. The the, the Beatles uh, were supposed to play a, a gig in Jacksonville, and uh, there was a hurricane, and uh, they had to spend uh, some nights in Key West, and so they they started talking. You know, they were in in the hotel room just just talking. And I uh, can't remember uh, exactly, but uh, maybe they were talking about uh, their mothers, and they they ended up crying, both Paul and John. And so he he remembered this uh, this thing, and he put he put it on in the song, and uh, that's a, that's a very that's a very moving uh, story, really. 
It is. It is. It's a. It's a great story. Um, uh, that that song has always fascinated me. The way he did that, and uh, um, you're right. You're you're right about writing songs like that. I mean, other people that have done that, they haven't had the the um, there's a unique uh, perspective. I shouldn't say unique perspective. They haven't had the they they haven't made them as good as here today. Here today is a wonderful song. It really is. So, Ken. Some of the things I want to bring up in the book that I found to be entirely new information, things that I didn't even know about, going back to the story about Lloyd Green. Lloyd mm-hmm. Green, who's a pedal steel guitar player, and he played on Sally G. He actually said that Paul asked him to join him on stage for his upcoming world tour. And yeah. uh, they were going to do a 15-minute set on tour together with a four-piece band. And it was going to be country music. There's something like that I never knew about. So, you know, how did you find out about that? Oh, I, 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 rem- I clearly remember that uh, what, what, I, what I did uh, when I was, you know, doing the book was uh, also simply doing this kind of thing. So I said, okay, Lloyd Green, great. Let's search for Lloyd Green over the net and see what's come up. And so, <laughs> and so this anecdote came up from, uh, uh, from an interview that uh, he did uh, in 2010 when mm. he, he told about this idea that Paul suggested. And so uh, Green also said, uh, it's the most regrettable decision of my professional life, having said wow. no that offer and I can understand because it would have been incredible yeah it would have been really a a great great thing to see Paul and Lloyd together on stage unfortunately it did not happen but uh, so that that's uh, that's how I discovered so it was it was all this information were, were also new to me before I discovered them <laughs> All right, I just want to bring up uh, Silly Love Songs, because one of the things you mention here is that it was, it was influenced by Al Green's song, Sha La La, which I'm very familiar with, but I never connected the two. Where did you get that from? It is something I noticed. Well, the arrangement of the, these two songs sounds uh, really... Well, uh, they sound a little bit similar, so I'm quite sure. <laughs> no, I'm not saying I'm sure, but uh, I can definitely hear something in this uh, song by uh, by Old Green that inspired uh, Sea Love songs. And I'm not talking about the you know the horn arrangement or strings arrangement that are a little bit similar. But there's also bass line. There's, there's some passages of the bass in uh, in old in old green songs that are really really similar to to the bass, uh, the famous bass line on Sweet Love Songs. So uh, our greens is uh, is one of the favorite singer of of Paul. He said he mentioned all some. Uh, interviews so um yeah i think that probably a source of inspiration for sea love songs came from uh from all green from all green and um yeah it's something that uh that i i just noticed it i don't know maybe three or four years ago uh, i didn't know the song from all from all green so but when i when i heard the song when i discovered the song I just heard something. Well, to me, there's definitely a similarity in the horns there. I definitely hear that, but I'll pay more attention to the bass. And uh, I, I truly believe that Paul, Paul Paul's a fan of Al Green. I just I would prefer to hear Paul admit it. <laughs> you know, that's the that's the number one way that that I learn about the Beatles' music through what they say about their music. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, the Sea Love Songs is a. Uh... But I know that that is uh, is one of McCarthy's biggest 
successes and uh you know it, it is a, it is a perfect pop song in my opinion you know because it combines uh, you know melody rhythm uh, arrangement ideas uh different parts uh, <laughs> baseline so what uh what you can ask more from 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 a song Oh yeah, well McCartney is a master at stringing together a lot of different sessions of, of songs or pieces of songs in a way where it's just very, um, you know, it, it, it's all seamless, you know, in, in a way that it just makes sense. And I mean, you take songs like Uncle Albert, Albert Halsey, they're all separate songs strung together and they all flow so well together that it becomes one song. And And probably nobody does that better than Paul. Yeah, definitely. I think that uh, he, he he's a master, as you as you said, of this kind of things. So, yeah, Uncle Albert, Admiral Hensey is a, is a fantastic example because they are. Mm. I don't know how many parts, but maybe maybe someone counted twelve different parts. You know, and it's difficult. It's difficult to 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 link all the parts together and uh, and uh, and have a num and have a U.S. number one. <laughs> so it was mm. uh, it was number one in, in the American charts. So you can have these kind of songs, but put it out as a single. It's really <laughs> that that is really incredible. Right. Okay, Steve. I got to ask about uh, Mullah um which he has a. There's a you know a thing with America because America didn't embrace it like the rest of the world did, but I mean it's such a I, I really have always loved that song. Um, number one, uh, Luca, uh, any any um, what what interesting details did you find out about how it was recorded? Number two, what do you think? I know I, I've heard people give various um, ideas of why he won't play it here. Why why don't you think he'll he'll do it in the U.S. Well, uh, the fir- the first thing, uh, Mall of Kinta is a particular uh, track because uh, I wanted to do one thing on the song because uh, everybody knows that uh, the Campbelltown Pipe Band uh, plays in the song. And I said, okay, but uh, what does it mean? So why don't we have the names of these players? Because they deserve to be named somewhere. Uh, it, it is the biggest uh, success in Paul's career as a single. And uh, nobody knows the names of these players. So what I did uh, was uh, to contact uh, uh, someone uh, on a Kintai forum and uh, ask for, for some documentation and to have uh, really the names of the 14 players. Uh, they gave me a, a number of uh, one of them, John Lang Brown, and uh, I spoke with him and, um, and uh, he sent me some, some documentation. And so we know the names of the players. And, uh, yeah, about the recording. Yeah, it was recorded uh, outdoors. That is a particular, particular technique. Not so, so unusual at the time, but particular technique. And the other thing was that, uh, yeah, the engineer, one of the engineers that I interviewed, it is Tim Summerhays, said that uh, the recording uh, had, uh, there, was, there was an accident during the recording because at a certain point, they they noticed that there was some oil or, or something on the tapes, and uh, and they they realized that uh, there were a lot of moths in the in, <laughs> in the barn, so they they squashed uh, on the tape. So they, they they were it was a problem because they had to clean the tapes. And so what, what is incredible is that uh, we have a, a, a recording by Paul that, uh, that uh, could have been cancelled, <laughs> could have been mm. not uh, u- useful for, for, 
for this reason. So <laughs> that is uh, interesting and uh, and also funny. And uh, I don't know. You asked me why Paul doesn't play Mother of Kintai in America. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I don't know. It, it was not uh, it was not a success, as you, as you said in in America. And so I don't know. Maybe this could be a reason. I know that. Uh, he plays the song in Canada or in Australia, all these places where there is a Scottish community. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know if there are places in America where, where the, there is a Scottish community or not. But uh, I, do think, I do think that maybe that maybe uh, he simply knows that uh, the song was not was not uh, you know well received or, or was not a success in America and he prefers not to not to play. I don't know. I don't know if it's right or not. But this is this could be could, could introduce another another discussion about uh, the set list during McCartney concerts that are. That are always uh, dividing uh, the, the the fans because you mm -hmm. know that too too many Beatles songs or uh, we 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 want we we would like to listen maybe to something different. But in the end, I can understand uh, Paul's choice about uh, about his set list. I, I would I would definitely do the same as as him. I'm not sure I, I understood the last thing that you said there. You're 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 not in favor of what Paul does with his set list? No, 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 no. I'm, I, I can understand uh, why he does, and uh, I, I, would, uh, I would do the same uh, as him. So I can understand that uh, he's playing many Beatles songs, and, and, and uh, it's, not, it's not something that you can uh, argue. So Beatles songs are so important. For, for our culture, let me say, that I can understand. I, I'm a big fan of his solo career, as, as you can imagine, <laughs> having, mm. having written the book. But I can understand it's not easy for him to to go out and uh, and say, well, let's play Uncle Albert. Well, he can he can pick up uh, one or two songs, but the Beatles material is so much important. So what he can do, what he can do, and I'm. I'm trying maybe to suggest to to to, to someone uh, uh, on, on a couple of forums since maybe do a, a one special night or one or two special nights when he collects all this uh, uh, suggestion from fans and do a solo material concert because it's a shame uh, on the other hand uh, that uh, there are so many great songs that uh, have never been played live. So what he can do is a special night like a, you know, kind of a unplugged or up close show and uh, and choose uh, choose songs uh, only from the solo period. That that would be interesting. He can the thing is we've talked about this a lot on the show when you're when you're packing stadiums and you're playing to 30, 40, 50,000 people most of the people there, in order to please all of them, you got to play songs that people know. And as, as much as I would love to see him go deep into his solo catalog, and there's so many great songs that he's done that the average person doesn't know, and a lot of, you know, the true McCartney fans are aware of, but if you're, if you're going to try and please a huge crowd, you got to mainstream it, you know. And because of the fact that there's always new generations of fans that are discovering the Beatles, and that alone is, is so, so much... You know, it's something to celebrate, and those people want to hear the Hey Judes and the Let It Be's and Yesterdays and those songs. You can't avoid playing them. But what Paul could do is do something like a more intimate show, smaller venues, where he's focusing a lot on his solo material, record that stuff, put out DVDs of those concerts of him doing solo material. Yeah. Um, I think it would work better that way. So that music doesn't get ignored. No, no, I, I completely agree, and uh, it could be a great idea. It could be a great success, I think. 
because mm. uh, what what I'm maybe he's when when he he faces a big audience is a little bit concerned that uh, uh, the, the the feedback from the audience uh, if he plays uh, Monk Bear Moonlight it's not uh, the best because uh, uh, th there are not so many hardcore fans of his solo career so a as you said uh, when you when you play Hey Jude everybody joins in in the chorus mm. when you play Let It Be. Uh, so it, the feedback, the feedback is uh, is important. I, I can I can imagine myself playing something or, or saying something to to another to some people and have a negative or a not so positive feedback and uh, an enthusiastic feedback. What would you choose? So <laughs> this is human. And though, so this is this is perfectly understandable, and so right. so yeah, could be it could be an idea to 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 have a, a small venue or a small tour with this kind of material. Okay, I need to bring up a, a subject which is to me a little bit sensitive, because there are a lot of authors of Beatle books who do this, and that is that they, especially in the early years of the solo Beatles, they kind of look for songs or read into the lyrics and they try to, they think that the songs are about the other Beatles or John writing about Paul or Paul writing about John. And certainly early on, after the Beatle breakup, that did happen. Certainly when you're looking at Ram followed by Imagine. But like I said before, I tend to look at what the Beatles have said about their own music and look at that as being the way that we should look at their music only because they're the writers. And Paul has admitted to many people, was writing about John, he admitted Dear Friend was about John. Obviously, John writing How Do You Sleep was about Paul. And the thing that kind of disturbs me about some authors is that sometimes I think they read too much into these songs where if there's any kind of uh, lyrics that are extremely personal, that convey hurt feelings, that it must be about the other Beatle. And uh, for one thing, like, for example, uh, Dear Boy, Paul has said publicly it's about Linda's first husband. It yeah. was about saying to him, look what you've missed. Look at the mistake that you made. It wasn't Paul saying that to John. But you actually say in the book that maybe Paul's lying. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. In this this particular case, uh, uh, I, I agree with you. I, I don't like to to read uh, uh, too much uh, into the lyrics or meanings of the songs. Uh, so, so the thing is, uh, I'm presenting uh, what uh, what. They they say so. Paul said it was uh, about uh, Linda Linda's ex-husband. Uh, I personally, in this particular case, am not convinced. But I can be wrong, obviously. So so when I'm when I'm expressing a personal point of view, it is clear. So what I understand from your what you're saying is that if the important thing to me is not presenting uh, an interpretation as a fact. So okay. that, that, is, that is something I, I'm, I try to avoid. I personally think that maybe, and it's, and it's written in the book, maybe, that maybe Mogberry Moon Delight could be, could be, could be uh, similar in a, in a vocal style to something that John did in plastic on a band, but but it's it's only it's only what I hear. It's not a fact. So okay, uh, the important thing is to draw a line between what you are saying and uh, and, and and the facts. So this is a mainly a book of facts. Then here and here and there, I try to maybe to add something personal. But uh, but the important things are facts. So if we have facts, we can maybe add something without 
these things, uh, you know, my opinion is, uh, uh, it's your opinion or uh, anyone's opinion. Okay, as long as the readers understand that this is your opinion and, not, and are not, they're not thinking that you're saying this is a fact. I mean, what, what you say in Monkberry Moon Delight, and I wrote this down here, you say the two opening verses are the key elements of the song, presumably describing the terrible nights spent by McCartney after the Beatle breakup. Just to explain to me how, how you interpret the song that way. Yeah, it, it, I explain it because uh, Monkberry Moon Delight is, is a song, uh, it's a particular song, and Paul uh, really never, never explained uh, the meaning, if there's a meaning, because I'm not sure <laughs> there's a meaning. But uh, I found uh, I found an interview, an interesting interview by by Paul, just digging the book, when he said he said uh, this is a, an interview that is uh, included in uh, uh, his book uh, many years from now. He said uh, I stood all summer with a note in my stomach. So this this image uh, is kind of particular to me because in the song's lyrics he said uh, I, I stood with a note in my stomach. That that is mm-hmm. that is an expression. So I'm not I'm not saying that uh, he were he was certainly referring to this, but. Uh, but definitely, the months following the Beatles' breakup were not easy for Paul. So I would not say that this is a, a song uh, about uh, anything related or connected to this fact. But personally, I think it's, it's, it's very likely about uh, this kind of feeling. See, he was, uh, he had, uh, during these months, so it's a particular song. It's a, it's a I would describe uh, Mont Moonlight as a raging song. I could, I feel these things, but uh, you know, I try, I try always to explain why I, uh, I interpret the song in a, in a particular way. All right, can I bring up one more example? Yeah, um, okay. let me roll it. Let me roll it, you say, is a conciliatory message to John. Whereas Paul said that was about him rolling a joint. So I understand yeah. when people say let me roll, it sounds like John. It's got that plastic auto band feel. And I, can, I can certainly hear that. But lyrically, probably has nothing to do with John. No, no, I, 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 I agree. Uh, has nothing to do lyrically. But, uh, you know, Paul, Paul is a very particular artist and uh, he likes uh, maybe not to be so direct in these things and in his songs and it's, this is part of his genius so mm. well I, I think that uh, the song has no lyrical meaning to Joan but maybe when, when, when he recorded the song maybe he just added a little bit of effect, uh, and in the end, in the end, it was it, it sound it sounds a little bit like John, so not more. I think that if he intended to to lend a hand to John or something, this is maybe the best way to do it because you are not saying anything, but you maybe if it's if it's a, a, a message, if it's a message, this is the best way to to launch it. So that there's something to me. There's something in this song. Obviously, Paul has, has said it was about the joint, but he said only uh, in 2010. So he, he, did, he didn't say this at the time of the release of the song. Hmm. Okay. Steve? Getting back to the set list um, that we were talking about earlier, Luca, um, there's been a lot of, and I know I've written about it in the past, uh, there's been suggestions that Paul do solo albums, you know, complete solo albums like some people have done. 
he could do a, a symphonic kind of concert. Uh, have you ever? Uh, would you be in favor of something? Because you were saying you want you like the balance between the Beatles songs and the solo songs. Would you be in favor of him doing something distinctly solo like that? With with strictly solo material. Yeah, I mean, doing a full solo. In other words, for example, featuring a people were were hoping, for example, during the uh, Ram anniversary that he would do Ram complete, and he, of course he didn't do that. And he's, uh, I believe, he's said he would he would not do that. But I mean, was that was that something you would be you'd be in favor of? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. But it could work as a special night if he, mm-hmm. if he, I'm I'm, I'm really. Uh, I'm, I'm really sure that uh, if he announces a special night with uh, solo material and said we won't, we will play the whole Ram album, and uh, it, it will be a success, absolutely, mm-hmm. because it's a special project and there are so many people that want to hear this kind of thing. So it is not it is, the only thing that I'm concerned about is that it's not easy for him to sing these songs uh, now that he's 72, even if, even though he's, he's singing great these days. But, mm-hmm. but you know, uh, over 40 years has passed. So, but, you know, it could, be, it could be an interesting project. And I think that the feedback from, from the audience uh, could be surprising also for, for him that... It is a is a little bit uh, you know shy about his uh, his solo material. We we, we all know why, but uh, uh, maybe it's not. Uh, maybe someone has to to make makes him understand that uh, a, a special night with this kind of uh, songs uh, could really work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point about about the forty year. You know the forty year uh difference in and his voice um that's that's an interesting that's an interesting point but yeah there's been a lot of people that have wished he would do that, and of course it doesn't look like he's going to but um you know by doing that obviously you, you concentrate on you get away from the from the entire career thing and you have people kind of uh, focusing in on one particular aspect of the career, and sometimes you can really get, especially the way people tend to go off on things and and really kind of get really detailed on things. You could get some you, things could get a little weird there. So, but uh, yeah, that's interesting that you that you said that. So, Ken, Luke, as someone who's so familiar with McCartney's entire body of work, do you think that he is a very misunderstood musician because so much of the world zeroes in on the Beatles and understandably so considering how great they, the Beatles were, how amazing that catalog was, how important they were historically. And most people, when it comes to Paul's solo career, they don't know most of his material. They don't know the breadth of his material. And yet he has, this is my opinion, he has that reputation for being Mr. Pop, you know, the person who who writes commercial pop songs, silly love songs, of which he's known for. Do you think that he's an, a misunderstood artist, or do you think that he really is... Uh, certainly, when you look at, at the feedback that he gets from his concerts, he's got to be one of the most beloved artists in the world. How do you, how do you think the world looks at him? Well, certainly... The word looks at him, as you said, uh, mainly as a ex-Beatles and a pop star or, or pop composer. I don't know if uh, he's misunderstood, because in truth, he did a lot of different things, experimental things, you know, classical things. Uh, I personally don't think that his classical output is um, particularly important. I do like a couple of things, but uh, he's a composer of pop music, and I don't think uh, I don't think he could succeed in the same way in classical. But uh, well, I don't know if he's misunderstood. Uh, uh, I I'm quite sure that his legacy as a solo artist 
would be maybe uh, um, understood better uh, maybe in, during in, in the next years because uh, because it, it deserves. Uh, I think that uh, he likes to be to be considered uh, as a composer of uh, great songs, of a composer even of pop songs. I I think he likes uh, in the end. Obviously, he, he would like. Mm, uh, maybe a, a, a wider recognition because uh, is is maybe the the only one that could do all this different kind of music with this uh, quality. There's no no one there's no one in the world that could do all these different things like him. But we will see his legacy uh, also as a as a solo artist. Uh, would be recognized in, uh, during the next years. What years are you referring to? Well, just, <laughs> well I, I don't know, but uh, but uh, I think that that uh, now is now is uh, currently touring. So maybe if he if he stops touring, for example, and uh, maybe that could be that could be the right moment when also the soul catalog. Could be discovered by by a wider audience if it tours uh, like it's doing now with all these Beatles success successes. Maybe mm. it's uh, difficult for for people because he's 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 linking his name to the Beatles once more. Right. If he maybe in a, I don't know. I, I hope not, but. Uh, it will be come a moment when he, he stops touring, and maybe this could be could be the the right moment to discover his uh, solo output better. Okay. Okay. All right. We really we really have to wrap things up here. But Luca, it has been great having you as a guest on our show. Let me once again mention the title of the book. It's called Paul McCartney Recording Sessions 1969 to 2013. A Journey Through Paul McCartney's Songs After the Beatles. And this book is now available worldwide, correct? Yeah, uh, it's been uh, finally hit the uh, U.S. at the end of June, so it's, uh, you, can, you can find it on Amazon.com. Okay. Well, Luca, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, everybody listening, I hope you all pick up this book because... If you need information about every single song that Paul wrote, everything from when it was recorded to quotes from people who were involved with the sessions, it's all in here. And it's the most complete book so far. And I hope that you keep updating this book because we need that. <laughs> uh, and would, as you know, since would, Paul is as, you know, he still keeps on working and he'll always be productive. So thank you so much for putting out this book and for being a great guest. Thank you to you both. I, um, I was really honored. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca. Thank you. Uh, thank you for taking the time to put the book together, and thanks for being with us and, and talking about it. I really appreciate it. Thank you to you both, and bye to everybody. All right. That has been great having Luca Parassi on our show. I'm Ken Michaels for Things We Said Today, thanking all of you for listening, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci uh, on Worldwide Skype saying we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.